Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker with OCTO, which is, stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. We're very pleased to have you with us today. And we're very pleased to have our presenter today, Chris Clapp with the Ocean Sewage Alliance, who's gonna be talking about getting our, well, SHIT together, the urgent need and opportunities to improve public and ocean health by addressing sewage pollution. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know how you can ask questions. We highly encourage questions during the webinar. Um, we'll save most substantive questions to the end, but it's possible we can ask clarifying questions. I can relay them to Chris during the presentation. Um, so send whatever occurs to you uh, in as you please. Uh, there's two ways to send in questions. You can send them into the question panel. Um, those are only visible to um, myself and Chris, or you can send it, things in through the chat. With If you post things in the chat, you have the option of making it visible to just me, Chris and I, or everyone. Um, you're also welcome to post relevant comments and thoughts uh, in the chat um, to Chris and I, or every, everyone, all attendees. We just ask that you um, be respectful in using the chat and that keeping it on the top topic and respectful, but feel free to post things and other relevant information for um, all attendees in the chat. Okay, so again, feel free to send questions whenever. Um, Chris, we're very pleased to have you today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you for that warm welcome, Sarah. Uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started so that hopefully we have plenty of time to um, chat at the end. Give me a second, folks. As Sarah mentioned, I am I'm the director of the Ocean Sewage Alliance. We are a partnership-driven organization uh, formed by some of the leaders in uh, coral restoration field, uh, habitat restoration field, who all uh, started to realize that they had this common challenge uh, that was inhibiting uh, their restoration efforts. Uh, and this, this was happening all over the world um, in different systems with different practitioners. Uh, I, for background, and you'll see this in some of my slides, I'm uh, from the Middle Atlantic slash Northeast region of the United States and worked on coastal ecosystems such as uh, shellfish and seagrass, uh, namely Zostera, uh, and and salt marshes. So that that's my background and how I came here because the work that we were doing here um, was being hampered by uh, this overarching threat of nutrient pollution from wastewater. And so I'll go ahead and get started here. I believe this slide is from our, our partner Vi uh, in Hawaii. Uh, as you can see, they have the same challenge here. And the reality is, uh, we have a common problem. It's us. We all go to the through, to the bathroom, and it all goes somewhere. There is no away, right? There's no, you know, we want to think that you can sit on the toilet, flush it, forget it, and that it goes somewhere, and somebody deals with it. But there technically is never an away. And what that has resulted in is roughly eighty five percent of the world's wastewater ent enters the oceans untreated. This is a paper uh, recently released by Ben Halpern et al., a uh, synthesis paper looking at uh, a whole number of other um, papers and methodologies determined to that, um, that determine how much, uh, what the extent of the contributing areas are. Um, and uh, looking at the review of this, 
through my own little personal lens in my own little corner of the world, this number might actually be under uh, valued and it might even be worse, but uh, it's a pretty startling number to say the least. And so what I mean by away, and let me take a step back here for a second. So when we, most people hear the term or think about wastewater entering the oceans or the wastewater entering a coastal area, you might think of like a big, a single big pipe that uh, is just spewing raw wastewater directly into the coastal environment. And while that in some cases is true, as you might see here in this picture, uh, that's not certainly the only way, right? So there's uh, direct pipes that have no treatment whatsoever, and that's raw wastewater. Uh, and then there's um, combined sewer overflows, which you would see here. Um, this is a cartoon from Surfrider uh, illustrating how combined sewer overflows work. This is um, in theory when some of the larger cities or metropolitan areas were um, being developed in the early 1900s and you had just as many horses as cars on the roads or more, uh, it made sense to try and capture everything that was falling on the roads during rain events convey it somewhere, treat it, and then discharge it. Uh, however, over time, uh, that really doesn't make much more sense as you have more impervious pavement and now your collection area is getting bigger. So these combined sewer overflows happen more often. And so basically what happens is you get a rain event, the water fills up, heads over this weir, and you get raw sewage entering your water body. You could also have uh, separate sewer overflows, which is just when the system backs up. Uh, this could happen for any number of reasons, leakage into the system, a failure at the, at the plant, or as uh, we've all come to know and love the great London uh, fatberg that was tracked for the last few years. Uh, fats, oils, and greases, and rags, and things get into the conveyance system and can block sewers up, and you have uh, raw sewage overflowing that way as well. But that's not the only way. Uh, much of the world, if not uh, uh, elsewhere, in particular here where I live, is heavily reliant on decentralized systems or individual homeowner systems. And so this is uh, a cesspool, even a, even a properly designed septic system, which is just a tank and a cesspool, if not treated properly, uh, also discharges uh, effluent into the groundwater, that groundwater eventually makes its way uh, either directly through the groundwater into the surface waters, or in some cases it backs up uh, during flooding events and can go directly into the surface water bodies. And as I mentioned, this is happening in all systems all around the world. Uh, impacted coral reefs, you have the reefs suffering as a direct consequence of viruses uh, in wastewater train that also impacts the holobionts and the reefs themselves. This could also be in the form of macroalgae smothering the reefs, uh, preventing them from being able to photosynthesize and ultimately killing the reefs. Um, but in many other coastal ecosystems around the world, as I said, in here in my neck of the woods, uh, I was focused on uh, Zostra marina, the, the eelgrass in the upper left corner. Uh, we, then, we also have a whole number of harmful algae blooms. These range from brown tides to rust tides to mahogany tides to red tides. Some of these harmful algal blooms are harmful to marine, marine life only such as the, the brown tide you see in the left-hand corner. Uh, and some of them are harmful to people um, and cause things like diuretic shellfish poisoning um, and other gastrointestinal diseases. Not the nicest thing to promote when you might rely on tourism or fisheries. The harmful algal blooms also have a secondary impact in that when they uh, respire in the evening or when they start to decay, cause low dissolved oxygen in the bottom waters, uh, but also promote a, a, a 
condition known as coastal acidification, because uh, as that as that oxygen level drops, it also drops the pH. So coastal ecosystems with high nutrient loading from wastewater, uh, as well as from agriculture, but where I live, it's almost all wastewater, um, are really driving acidification processes in the coastal bays that are or orders of magnitude much more harmful than, uh, than ocean acidification caused by atmospheric CO2. This, leads, this can also lead to fish kills and even uh, salt marshes, which we rely on for uh, our protection uh, here in the northern latitudes are, are failing because the plants are no longer investing in their root infrastructure and putting all of their energy in their above ground biomass, uh, causing them to fall apart um, during storm events, as well as just regular wave action. And part of the, the cause of this is, you know, we currently view um, water as a single stream use commodity. And this greatly depreciates its value. The fact that you could pump water, utilize it in a home, and then discharge it some way, whether that's by cesspool or, or by sewer, uh, greatly undervalues water as a resource. And there's so much more in that stream that can be reclaimed and reused um, that we're missing out on. And it really begs the argument to close the loop on how water is managed so that we appreciate its full cycle. Here you see a sign, um, I, I believe I took this picture in Florida where they are irrigating uh, roadway gardens with, with reclaimed wastewater or reclaimed water. And, you know, it really kind of makes you think, you know, okay, we, we pump water, we treat it, and then we can spray it on someone's lawn. And, and not only that, but you, we're going to import petroleum-based fertilizer products to fertilize crops that we then consume and then, and then that waste then goes down the drain to a sewage treatment plant. We have to pay for it to be managed there. It doesn't get treated as well. It ends up in our coastal water bodies and we, we then pay again in the form of degraded water bodies. If we could close that loop, get those nutrients out of the waste stream, we could begin to decrease our reliance on petroleum-based fertilizers and create a circular economy around fertilizers, just as they're creating a circular economy around uh, the fresh water here. So this presents opportunities. There's plenty, you know, we can't always view things as a challenge. We have to then acknowledge the challenge and think about where do we go from here? What's next? What can we do better? And how can we do that better in a way that makes uh, the economy stronger, it makes people's lives healthier, and it makes the ecosystems more resilient. And the good news is that this is a totally solvable problem. Here what you see is an example from um, Western Long Island Sound. Uh, for those of you elsewhere in the world, Long Island Sound is the body of water that it separates uh, Connecticut on the mainland of the U.S., from Long Island to its south. And uh, it's, it's bound by New York City at its westernmost terminus and open to the open ocean on its eastern end. Um, and they started about 25 years ago with a campaign to uh, total maximum daily load, a nutrient budget for the sound to reduce nutrients. I believe the goal was 58% Reduce reduction of nitrogen to by uh, strictly through point sources alone. So sewage treatment plants emptying directly into the Western Long Island Sound. They've achieved that goal uh, by 125%. And so what's happened here is you see on the right hand side, you see the water treatment point point source loads steadily going down since the, the mid 90s. Uh, until current day. 
And on your left-hand side, you'll see the aerial extent of hypoxia or the area of low dissolved oxygen uh, in the sound, which has also steadily gone down in correlation with the reducing of the nutrient load. And what's really surprising here is that this has happened despite uh, warming waters, which helps to stratis stratify the water column, uh, it, inhibiting the mixing of the deep cold water from the warm surface water. So we're getting this reduction in hypoxia and anoxia in Long Island Sound despite warming temperatures. So this works. Uh, another great example is Tampa Bay in Florida. Um, they just got hit pretty hard with Ian last week. So thoughts with them. But this Tampa Bay had been a leader uh, in the US uh, in environmental recovery. Here's a quote from uh, a, a, a paper called Bay Soundings. Uh, dramatic improvements of water quality have allowed seagrass to rebound to levels not seen since the 1950s. And so what this really demonstrates is that addressing nutrient loads, and particularly from wastewater, is a restoration practice. It is not a practice in and of itself. It's a practice towards ecosystem recovery, and the system then responds on its own uh, in concurrence with restoration activities. And so, you know, what lies at the heart of both of those plans, uh, projects was a plan. They set a plan that was created and took decades to accomplish, uh, but, they, but they did accomplish their goals. Here's a tiny little island in the Peconic Estuary. Uh, it has its own confined aquifer. The majority of the residents uh, have a their on-site well for their house, as well as an on-site cesspool. And so it's not uncommon for somebody's cesspool to be not far from their neighbor's well. And what you see here on the left-hand side is the current day um, situation there. The red colors, the brighter, warmer colors uh, would indicate higher nitrogen loads to the environment or to the aquifer, their drinking water. Uh, and then also those loads then reaching the coast. And what you have on the right-hand side is if they implemented their current plan uh, with today's technology, uh, performing at a minimum standard, not performing as it, as it is optimized for, uh, how much more resilient their drinking water is, as well as the nutrient loads to the coast would dramatically reduce. There's some bright reds that persist because of, of errors in the model, of boundary conditions in the model. Um, but by and large, you see a, a drastic reduction in the nutrient loads reaching their surface waters. And one thing to note here is that the bottom uh, right-hand corner uh, of this image is, is protected land. And that's why it shows up as having uh, near background levels of nitrate in the groundwater. So this is doable. You just have to create a plan and stick to it for the long term. And so what are solutions? What are people doing? And there are so many solutions. And I don't want to get hung up on solutions because they really are dependent upon the site. The, uh, the cost feasibility and the, uh, you know, what's acceptable by either through local tradition or by um, other community standards. So you could have everything from a giant tertiary wastewater treatment plant here that you see on the bottom left-hand side that has uh, that utilizes reclaimed water for, for washing purposes, as well as for irrigating nearby golf courses and ball fields. Um, you could have created wetlands and other natural systems, soil-based systems. And then on the bottom right-hand side here, you see an individual on-site wastewater treatment system that would replace a cesspool or a traditional septic system just used to serve us separate solids from liquids. 
And there's all sorts of opportunities in between here where you could have small neighborhood systems, you could have uh, small neighborhood wetland systems, any mix and match of things is possible. However, much of this is still thinking of water as a single stream product. And like I said, it's time that we begin to think of ways of creating circular economies. There's the opportunity for biofuels, either utilizing the solids for fuels or a new and emerging research where they allow the wastewater to ammonify, basically become ammonium, and then separating, splitting the nitrogen from the hydrogen and utilizing it as a source for hydrogen fuel. Some really exciting emerging research around that. There's always the opportunity for water reuse, as I said, and in many people would even argue that a cesspool or a conventional septic system is the oldest form of reuse because it, it recharges the aquifer uh, that would then lead to streams and ultimately your drinking water source. The challenge there is, is new and emerging contaminants uh, such as PFAS and 1,4-dioxane and other pharmaceuticals that we need to find better solutions for. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, striving towards nutrient recovery, you know, breaking our reliance on um, petroleum-based fertilizer products and getting more of what's considered waste back into the agricultural sector or even for residential landscape sector. So what does some of this look like? So here, here is the uh, nutrient reclamation, uh, creating the product known as Bloom uh, with DC water. Uh, really exciting project there. Uh, fresh pollutable water. I believe this is a water bottle from uh, Singapore where they go direct to bottled water. All of this is possible. And so I was advised to keep this short and, and discussion-based. So uh, without much more, I'm gonna encourage you all, uh, we have a lot of these resources on our newly launched Knowledge Hub. Um, everything from uh, documenting the problem to what some of the opportunities are. Uh, we have a great library to browse full of all sorts of information on all of these subjects. Um, please feel free to, to jump in. I could show you, oh, where did this one go? Our, uh, we have a video launch as a tutorial of how to get through the, the knowledge, how to navigate the knowledge hub and explore some more uh, done by our, our wonderful Larissa Balzer. Uh, also, please check out on our website, our practitioner's guide for ocean wastewater pollution a really great primer, uh, thorough on, uh, on the challenge and opportunities and some case studies of where people are beginning to take action. And so I have a couple of videos we could go to after uh, chat and comments are addressed, but let's get to some conversation. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, you can send in questions through the question and answer uh, or through the chat. So um, we didn't cover solutions in depth here. Where, um, what are the key factors, Chris, in terms of choosing a solution? I mean, cost would actually, what other situational factors um, are, are going to be most important? Well, I think some of the things that really drive um, how you arrive at solutions is what's your what's your goal, right? So I think it all starts from understanding what are the endpoints you want to reach, and what uh, what the capacity of the region is to get there, and and then let you know love the problem more than the solution, and be open minded. The more open minded we can be to solutions, the better solutions we will we will create. So some of these solutions like um, water reuse 
and and nutrient recovery, um, they hit major roadblocks when it comes to um, either cultural challenges like just taboos and, and the ick factor to um, straight up cost competitiveness with traditional practices. So, um, you know, policies and finances would have to really drive markets and let innovators know that there's going to be a market there for them. Um, yes. So Rich Earth, yeah, I, Rich, you know, Rich Earth, thank you, Mark. Uh, Rich Earth has been doing some great stuff up in Vermont for a number of years. Um, they do urine collection uh, at the community level directly. Uh, that's certainly a solution. One of the things we were, again, sometimes policies and finance have to drive this. So I, I pitched one point, um, the, uh, the concept of, of, can you just ban importing fertilizers to a particular region that would then motivate the the closed economy at the local scale for urine urine diversion for growing kelp and seaweeds and and on, and biosolids um, rather than making it oh so easy to just import something new and so sometimes you know there's this interplay between policy finance and what the solutions might look like that you have to work out at the local scale and also you know a working with a fully developed, built out urban or ex-urban area might limit the amount of um, work that you could uh, do as far as, you know, replumbing for additional uh, water recharge and reuse. So there's a whole bunch of drivers. Um, the closer we can get to those closed economies, the better. And the um, it's really relying upon what the, the structure of the area that you're working in looks like. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark, and so for the question. There's this, this question from Jill Murray yes. about recreational risk. Yep, and, and so, do you mind if I just go ahead and read it for anybody? Yeah, please. Right. Okay, and it says, you didn't focus much on recreational risk. You, do you think it is an important driver? So I'm trying to think of um, if she, I'm going to ask a clarifying question. So um, is recreational risk tied to doing the, the at the cost of doing nothing? What's the cost to recreational recreational activities if we do nothing? Or is it the call the, the the risk to recreation for utilizing reclaimed resources. And I'm, I'm not quite sure I could answer both of those if you'd like, but I think the, the cost, the recreational risk, if we do nothing from the perspective of pathogens and other contaminants it, entering our surface waters where, where tourists or, 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 or regular people are, um, are recreating or they're fishing, there's there's certainly a risk there and a cost to doing nothing based upon on on that. I'm not quite sure about recreational risks in in rec reclaimed. Um, yeah, so thank you for clarifying. I think that the, there's a much higher risk and cost to be to be paid for recreation by doing nothing. Um, and I was about to explain the other side where. Um, I was part of a reuse working group and um, all of the, the politicians in the room were worried about what the public thought of the ick factor for reusing reclaimed water to irrigate a golf course. And they kept going back and forth, what the, what the public think? What would the public think? And the one guy in the room who, who managed the golf course that used reclaimed water said, you know, said, stood up and very politely said, you know, the only people who have the concern about the ick factor are you, are you folks in the room here. When I deal with the public who utilize my golf course, they ask why we didn't do this sooner. So I think the recreational risk as Jill 
uh, very appropriately pointed out, there's much more risk to, of doing nothing than there is of a perceived risk of utilizing reclaimed resources. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, there's a question that came in, uh, let's see. I just attended the EU Water Technology Week in Leuwarden. Interesting networking opportunity hosted by the Dutch Water Alliance. However, much focus on EU applicable solutions. Is there a network organization for water treatment tech companies in the Caribbean? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that's a great uh, question. I know that uh, Chris well, Corbin from the uh, UN Environmental Program has been doing a whole lot of work on, on, on technology and um, in the Caribbean for the last 20 years. Uh, and, and I know we, we, the Ocean Sewage Alliance, are trying to build out a lot of those resources here so that we could be a source for those for that as well. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and if anybody does know the answer, please go ahead and post in the chat uh, any any uh, additional resources that might be helpful. Okay, so another one, Kate Brown here from the Connecticut DEP. I've worked for uh, water quality issues in the Long Island Sound for the past 30 years. Thank you for highlighting the success of our national estuary program and our federally approved no discharge area. One thing that has helped us to achieve positive results has been the expansion of our pump out facilities and pump out vessels that move over 1 million gallons of concentrated recreational vessel sewage waste each year. This is funded by the Federal Clean Vessel Act. Hi, Kate, good to see you. Uh, thank you for, for highlighting the, the no discharge zone work as, uh, also. And um, you know, while, while that highlight there for, for you all uh, in uh, LISS, um, was uh, focused on the Western Sound um, point source work. Um, that's because that's really easy to point out in a, in a graph format uh, and not to be dismissive of the uh, watershed scale work that's currently happening uh, on both sides of the sound and, and decentralized as well as uh, other uh, not so clear sources. So thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Thank you uh, to both of you. Okay. So from Swarna, um, I work on microbial source track down from uh, non-point source and coastal watersheds. And we have identified human sanitary Oh, it's screen jumped. Human sanitary source is one input also. However, the issue is these watersheds have many municipalities of different sizes with their own treatment systems, in addition to county regional uh, wastewater treatment plant crisscrossing. What might be the most effective strategy in these cases? Sorna, I think you point out a common challenge is the, um, is the, the need to better coordinate across municipalities, right? Because water knows, doesn't water doesn't recognize those political boundaries or those district boundaries. And so what needs to happen at um, at is more coordinated watershed planning and water integrate integrated watershed management approaches that can help recognize not only the point source, but the non-point source uh, contributions of wastewater to those coastal ecosystems. Uh, you could better then you could then better track and take credit for the work that you do, that it gets done, um, as well as hold each other accountable for where improvements need to be made. And so I think the um, just like Kate had mentioned before, um, you know, this this three decade long uh, effort in both the Long Island Sound and Tampa Bay, those are you know, multi-state multi um, concerted approaches. The estuary programs really provide a platform for those discussions and goal setting and tracking to happen. Um, and I know there's uh, many other models, you know, 
of intergovernmental agreements and MOUs to cooperate, as well as uh, less formal ways of just agreeing upon a watershed approach, setting goals and tracking them uh, would be really helpful. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and we're getting a lot of great resources uh, that are being posted in the chat um, from Mark Capron related to the question about resources in the Caribbean. Soil, SOIL, is providing safely managed sanitation service using waterless container based toilets and transformative waste treatment into agriculture grade compost in urban and peri urban communities in Haiti. And he provides uh, a URL for that. Um, a big picture question. Um, hello from Environmental Protection in the Caribbean. As a small organization advocating for proper sewage disposal, we and local governments have limited resources. Where do we start in determining which solutions to advocate for, which experts to consult, how to find funding? Any suggestions, Chris? Natalia, I mean, first and foremost, I'd say, you know, um, you know, sign on as a member of the Ocean Sewage Alliance. We, we could help try and find you some of those questions to, to answer. Um, you know, as someone who came from the advocacy community doing work on the ground, um, you know, I can't highlight enough how, how careful I always was in not advocating for a specific type of technology or a specific type of approach. And, you know, working together um, with the communities, with the governments to put together uh, plans and approaches that allow for the best technologies at the time to enter the market and for, um, for procedures by which removing people from that certified list that are not performing to your standards is really important. Um, and then, you know, how to find funding, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that is another great goal of the Ocean Sewage Alliance is to make this a top priority amongst funders, um, whether that be, um, you know, large intergovernmental multilateral type funding resources, or, or philanthropic based funding resources. Um, you know, part of my personal goal is to have, you know, I wanna be able to go to the next UN Ocean Conference and hear our leaders say, uh, climate change is the biggest threat to the oceans followed by uh, wastewater pollution and agricultural pollution and plastic pollution. That's, that, that's my goal is to have it right up there as number one and two so that when it becomes a priority, then the funding comes as well. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more that we need to get more funding in this space. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, we have a question that came in through the question panel uh, from Bruno. It's, uh, hello, thank you for your presentation and taking the time with us. Understanding that solutions are highly dependent on what type of pollutants exist at, local, at the local level and seeing that the focus of this presentation was on organic matter, what are the biggest challenges your group is finding when addressing the complex mixture of raw sewage content, i.e. pharmaceuticals, personal care products, metals, microplastic, organic chemicals? Uh, you know, that, <laughs> that is a great question. So, you know, in all of the, a lot of these treatment processes um, or some of the traditional or conventional treatment process chains and treatment process streams were never designed to uh, handle contaminants of emerging concern. Um, many of them do. Um, and surprisingly, um, you know, the smaller this, the treatment facility, you know, the, the closer to the source you could get, the better. Um, soil treatment systems at small scale seem to go a really long way, um, or, or soil treatment system following good pretreatment goes a really long way in removing a lot of uh, contaminants of emerging concern. Um, you know, another thing I'd have to say about a lot of, you know, the cocktail of new and emerging contaminants is, um, you know, that sometimes the, um, 
the focus of the attention uh, might be misguided at, you know, you're kind of shooting the messenger at that point. And we need to get back and, and refocus on the producers of those chemicals and hold them accountable as well. So the more that we could document the challenges pre presented by those contaminants, the better the case is to do something about them at, uh, from, be, from entering the waste stream to begin with or entering the supply chain to begin with. Um, I think that's, you know, that's my personal view on some of these contaminants of emerging concern is that we need, we need to refocus our attention on, um, on not starting that, it's not utilizing them. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, there was a question just about the focus of the Ocean Sewage Alliance. So um, from, from Mark, is the Ocean Sewage Alliance focused mainly on developing or developed countries? Isn't the most need for healthy oceans and recycling nutrients with tropical coastal communities that are mostly developing? Yes and no. So I, I would say, you know, the, the focus of the Ocean Sewage Alliance is to create a space where uh, folks like yourself can come together and, and productively uh, share stories, share lessons learned, share what's worked, what's not worked, most importantly, sharing what's not worked uh, in a way that, um, that can help others who want to be part of the solution get on their path to success. So, um, you know, we are a global organization. This challenge knows no limits. Uh, we all go to the bathroom uh, and it all goes somewhere. So, uh, you know, I don't think that we are limiting our focus right now to any one region or, um, or ecosystem type. Uh, like I said, I'm here in the Northeast of the US and there is a huge challenge here and and a lot of opportunity here as well. So, you know, it's um, it's about sharing information and getting uh, the network functioning and together so that you all could share information to get whomever it is, wherever they are, stuck unstuck from wherever they might be stuck. All right, good response, Chris. Thank you. Um, Okay, there's a question. Could we hear more about specific application of the solutions? Reuse, wetlands, seagrass propagation that were presented earlier. And how does that unit with the green cylinders work? <laughs> so that unit with the green cylinders, I didn't give, I, you know, like I said, I, I always try not to uh, give too much airspace to one particular technology. So, um, you know, reuse, if you uh, to get more specific on some of this, reuse could be any mean any number of things. Um, but most of the time, it means that water is uh, collected in a treatment system, conveyed to a, a sewage treatment facility, um, treated to a high degree, either tertiary or quaternary, and then uh, has some degree of pathogen and vi virus removal usually a fairly good degree of UV treatment. And, and then it goes out for reuse, um, primarily, uh, usually as irrigation. Um, however, in, in places that are uh, water starved, so thinking like uh, desert regions, either whether that's the Southwest of the US uh, or in many other parts of the world, uh, that bottled water from Singapore, um, that is quaternary treatment, which then gets reused for consumption. Um, and then if we, the, a wetland system or engineered wetland systems are, uh, they have, a, uh, they could have a pretty big footprint. Uh, so in places where real estate is a little bit tight uh, or expensive and, and, and engineering can be a challenge in certain places with wetlands, I've had, I had one built here um several years ago and it was quite an ordeal to build but they can be really simple machines to uh and i say machines in kind of a general term not that there's lots of moving stuff in them and they might have a single pump or something like that but they um they utilize the microbes uh in the interstitial spaces between 
the the roots and the soil uh, to to guide treatment. Um, the seagrass propagation that those were restoration activities that were failing because of wastewater treatment, uh, and I, that's not what I was highlighting there. Um, although there is a big push um, lately around growing kelps and other seaweeds in nutrient-rich waters uh, to, to remove nutrients as a mitigation measure, not as a, a treatment measure. And those green cylinders, that was a hydroaction on-site treatment unit. They make those, those are prefabricated, prefabricated fiberglass units that mimic the cycles of nitrification and denitrification for the single family use. Um, and that's one of the uh, dozen or so treatment units out there that's doing really well uh, for on-site upgrades. Uh, another great one is the Fuji Clean and the Orenco systems. And there's a whole bunch of different ones out there uh, that, that have aeration and recycling of the water within the treatment unit to get you know, denitrification. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yep. Um, a question from Karen. Um, I'm involved in managing coral reefs surrounding a small island in the Caribbean, Bonaire. To demonstrate that your wastewater treatment is effective or not, and to determine when you need to invest more into wastewater treatment, you need to monitor. But monitoring seawater quality is expensive and incredibly variable. With a limited budget, what would you advise as the best monitoring strategy? I, I, you know, the other thing that's really expensive and can be highly variable but extremely effective is this. There was the the woman who mentioned the source tracking, microbial source tracking, is a great way of, of measuring effectiveness of wastewater treatment uh, on reducing microbial counts in the water column. Um, measuring water surface waters for nutrient levels is, like you said, highly variable and doesn't always give you the full story. Um, and if your if your budget was limited, I don't know how much more I would invest in that. I I would also take the approach of looking for some near shore uh, ecological indicators. So you know, sea sea um, biofouling by macroalgae on your reefs or in your in your mangroves um, would be a good indicator. There's an indicator that I had used for seagrasses called the nutrient pollutant indicator. This could be a little bit costly too, but it's it's basically a, a ratio of how much nitrogen is in per a mass of tissue. And you could do isotopic fractionation of that also, but that's kind of complicated and really expensive. But I, I think the the you know water clarity and micro and, and basic microbial growth would be your your first and easiest bet. Okay, thank you, Chris. And I'm trying to go through and look for the. Um, there's been a lot of suggestions and and comments that have been sent in. The, which ones didn't go out to everyone? Um, and Peter's. Uh, suggested that caffeine is also an excellent indicator of sewage um, as something to monitor. Let's see. Um, and then there was also a, a comment. Um, I love Bonaire and dive there frequently. One thing I've noticed is that the dive boats don't have holding tanks. They discharge directly into the water. Maybe this would be a good place to start regulating boat waste. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was also a comment uh, that this was in relation to the question that came earlier about sort of the cocktail of things uh, that are in wastewater. And there was a comment that bryophytes or mosses are excellent at extracting heavy metals from wastewater. Okay. Um, okay, there's a, another comment, uh, very nice and informative experiences. Uh, we are developing a developing country far away from recycling treatment plants as they are cost effective and drain sewage directly. However, trying hard to communicate and transfer knowledge as academics through trainings. We started to save our coast through recognition of MPAs by publication. Um, and then they, they give a link to their, uh, some of their publications about their MPAs. 
Uh, there was also a comment that sucralose is useful for monitoring sewage contamination. So I'll look for any other comments we have, but we're running out of questions. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to send them in through the chat and the Q and then or the question panel. Okay. Uh, yep. Now we have one from Bruno. Um, has your group worked with responsible parties, i.e. regulators, municipalities, regarding engagement and outreach towards the public, industry, and responsible parties themselves? Is, if yes, have, have you seen good uptake from regulators and or good results? Um, as, as my role at, here at the Ocean Sewage Alliance, to date, no. What I would, Bruno, what I what I what I would like to do is to do the opposite: is to work with certain industries, and then influence those local governments to do more, because those are the folks that they tend to listen to. And so, the more that we can make this message relatable to to the industries that have the most influence, the boards of tourism, the recreational and commercial fishing industries. The more that we can make this effort more relatable to, um, for lack of a better term, the pocketbooks of, of the parties most affected and build the chorus that way, the more the local government would want, would feel supported to take action. Um, because I think in some places, you know, we mentioned earlier how it's kind of some people feel it's taboo, you know, just don't talk about it. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, we don't talk about what we do. But then the other part is that a lot of people don't talk about um, wastewater management because they feel it's expensive and they don't feel like their constituents feel it's a priority. So the more that we could engage the industry side, um, and then influence the regulators from that perspective, um, I think the more traction we'll have at, at a larger scale or at the local scales. Yeah, cruise ships. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's see, another question. Um, is there any relevant legislation pending in the US nationally? Um, I can't read the second part, but are you aware of any, or or internationally, what? That's a broad swath, but any anything pending in the U.S. regarding sewage pollution? Oh, well, the bodies of the the, the uh, waters of the U.S. legislation that was reinstated. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, you know, keeping the EPA active and afloat is really important to us right so you know keeping an eye on what cases get brought before the supreme court that may hinder the epa's ability to function um is is really important um keeping an eye on um and and letting them know that they're supported and supportive of those efforts so a lot of them a lot of the actions start locally at the local regional level and then trickle up um, I wanted to get to Drew's, I apologize for cutting that off, but yeah, go um, for it. You know, it's, you know, Drew, he, he touched on something important to me here uh, as a seagrass person myself, um, that the, you know, the dying seagrasses and manatees in, in Florida, that, you know, the Indian River Lagoon is heavily influenced by wastewater. They are another hot spot. Um, region in Florida with a lot of on-site treatment systems, uh, rising levels, rising sea levels compromise the existing infrastructure. The, um, it, it, there's a big signal there of wastewater in, in the harmful algal blooms, which then kill the seagrasses, which then starve the manatees. And, and like I said, some of those harmful algal blooms are directly um, impacting the manatees themselves. So, you know, I think that there's uh, a lot that a lot that needs to happen in Florida. I think even Biscayne Bay, I believe is, I think there's some approaching a million cesspools and septic systems in, in the Miami area. 
um, a huge, Florida is a huge hotspot for, um, for on-site treatment systems that are not, that were never designed to remove nutrients. Okay, thank you, Chris. There's also a question uh, from Marianella. Um, I'd like to know if there are any water or quality water quality values for nutrients for coastal marine waters. I'm thinking in nutrient values for recreational use, other uses, fishing, for example, and wildlife. So most of the uh, nutrient load values or nutrient standards, if you look at EPA standards, are driven by what's the nutrient level that will support a healthy oxygen level. As I mentioned, the TMDLs or the total maximum daily loads for um, the Long Island Sound and Tampa Bay as examples. Another successful one was the Chesapeake. Um, and so it, it, it can be dependent upon, you know, what the flushing time of the area is. There's, there's complex models that they come up with to make them more site specific. The, um, as far as there's another metric that I didn't put up there for Long Island Sound that was worth noting was areas that were open to shellfishing because shellfish accumulate the pathogens in the water that um, large bodies of, of shellfishing beds were opened as a result of the reduction in, in wastewater flows also because it also reduced the pathogen levels in those waters. So there's certainly, there's a, a, a correlation there between uh, recreation and commercial fishing use, um, and as well as for wildlife. But it's, 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 you know, can be highly dependent upon the system. So I'm, I'm sorry if that didn't really help. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Well, um, we have two more questions right now I'd like to cover. And uh, before we end, one is it's, uh, related to what you were just talking about. Um, it's from Tabor. Um, it's simple and economic to provide a decentralized system with high level secondary treatment with very low pathogen content. In Cambodia, our systems cost about $150 for floating and upland households. Yet this leaves nutrient risk rich discharge if urine separation and home garden irrigation are not used. However, Southeast Asian countries are adopting UN, US EPA and ISO discharge standards which significantly add cost and complexity to meet those standards. If a treatment system significantly improves the ambient water or groundwater quality, should that be an acceptable technology or should the ISO standards be met with more costly household systems? Certainly cost and simplicity and low maintenance are huge issues in developing countries. Yeah. Um you know, can, but that's a challenge. So the, the operations and maintenance, the cost associated with operations and maintenance of some of the, the um, determine uh, the, the decentralized systems could, could also be, be viewed as an opportunity and a work, you know, local workforce development opportunity. So Again, this is one of those, those interplays between what the potential finance is available, what the, what the regulatory appetite is for some policy and regulatory overview. Everything needs oversight. There, there's not a single system that doesn't require oversight. So it's you have to have that good mix of policies, funding, workforce training, uh, and behavior change on the homeowner side to really make anything successful. Um, the, um, you know, houses on stilts, you know, I'm sure Mark Capone on here has been, you know, promoting his urine diverting toilet idea for, you know, the whole time. So, uh, you know, that would be great, right? So if you were able to capture and utilize your uh, more of the urine and 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 you you know utilize it in your own gardens. That would be fantastic. Um, you know the, the the big goal is to try and keep both the pathogens and the nutrients out of the water. And finding that the most cost effective ways to do so is is an ongoing challenge. And um, you know the um, I've been working with the 
uh, New York State Center for Clean Water Technology for some time now. And they're, they're, um, they were originally a New York centered institution, but now their mandate has changed to be more global, which is really exciting. So hopefully, you know, they've joined the Alliance and hopefully we'll see some new things out of them as well. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, last question to finish up. Um, is there a resource website to educate government officials on the different sewage solutions and technologies available? They, I, we, you could utilize our library. We're gonna continue to add to it. Um, I would direct people there. And then the, um, you know, the, if you're in the US, the EPA has a long list of uh, decentralized, centralized treatment methods and um, technologies available. Um, there's a whole number of other um, places that you could look, but we're going to continue to uh, add more to our, um, our growing list in our library. Okay, fantastic. And I just put the uh, URL to the library up in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if anyone wants to click on that. Um, Chris, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for being here and presenting. Obviously, this is a topic of tremendous importance and interest globally. Um, and uh, it was great to learn what the Ocean Sewage Alliance provides and get some perspective on a lot of, of the challenges um, coastal and marine managers are facing with sewage pollution. And thank you to all of our participants. It was great discussion in the chat and lots of resources provided. If anyone does wanna get um, a transcript of the public chats, just uh, email me at sarah at octogroup.org and I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, thank you again for being here and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.